would you so welcome everyone um, to our Seleucid Wednesday. It is always one of the highlights in, in my month and I very much look forward to it. It's always very enjoyable to meet friends, uh, old friends and make new friends and uh, to do that with an enjoyable conversation about Seleucid history. But this time I do, I feel it's not the right thing to only start on a joyful note without um, at least making a statement on what's going on in southeastern Turkey and northern Syria, because, well, as we all know, uh, an abysmal earthquake has hit nearly the center of the region that we've been studying for, for many years and is in a certain way dear to all of us. And uh, instead of just calling for a minute of silence or anything else, I would like to encourage everyone to consider um, to make a donation to a charity of, of your choice, a charity that you think is doing good in, in the region to reduce the suffering of the people. So taking a deep breath, I do return to the more uh, enjoyable part of uh, what is expecting us today. We have a, a, a still young but already very distinguished speaker with us today, mm -hmm. Dr. Pierre Risson. Um, he's coming to us as a postdoctoral researcher from McGill University in uh, Montreal, Canada. And uh, it's only his third year after uh, defending his PhD at the Université de Montréal à Québec. I hope I pronounced it uh, correctly <laughs> uh, with all the prepositions. <laughs> uh, and um, so uh, he, and uh, his uh, PhD has already been published in a very distinguished series. Um, and it looks nearly like, like this book, although this is the first in the series of the, um, of, of the supplements, um, Supplement Francophone um, of the Phoenix series. Um, and so this was the first volume of the expert, Dr. Germain Payan, who will give feedback later on and he will, who will be introduced later on. Now, um, Pierre-Luc has been dedicating a significant part of his life to second century BCE um, in the Mediterranean world, trying to understand the rise of Rome and trying to to contribute to a debate in modern scholarship that um, goes back to the 19th century. Um, his MA thesis was um, a, a study devoted to Titus um, Quintius Flamininus, um, well, defended in 2016 and published as a monograph by, I think, Laval University Press around 2018. And in the same year that he had defended his PhD thesis, that is in 2020, also kind of a handbook or a course book on Roman history was published in its first edition. And there is already a second edition of that. Uh, it was co-authored, uh, but this is a great uh, way uh, to, to approach such uh, big themes nowadays. And I was just told that a third edition is underway. Um, and uh, as I've also learned in our conversation this morning, the third book, which is a revised and ex uh, extended version of the PhD um, thesis, was already published in, in Europe in December and uh, in North America this January. So these are really outstanding achievements only uh, by and in themselves. Um, uh, some of the many achievements on uh, the long CV that I have found, but instead I do of... not sleep much, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I understand precisely why. Um, so <laughs> I appreciate even more that you are with us today. Now, it might seem that I'm well prepared to, uh, to co-chair uh, this meeting, but I'm actually not this time because um, Pierre-Luc was uh, so generous, instead of sending us a draft of his paper, he sent us a draft uh, of his whole book. And he gave us a page range uh, somewhere in the middle, but I started at the beginning. And it was just so gripping that I couldn't bring it over me to skip. So I never made it to the pages that are actually covered by 
his presentation, but I really enjoyed reading the very long introduction that lays out the history of scholarship of, well, starting with Theodore Mommsen, but then focusing especially on Anglophone and Francophone scholarship, trying to explain Roman imperialism in the course of the second century BCE. And there's really a lot to learn. I've been studying um, these, this field for, for two decades at least, uh, but there was a lot for me to, to really take in anew and also to, to refine my understanding, to complete my understanding. Um, and uh, it was not only just traditional ancient historian scholarship, but also very close involvement with modern uh, political science approaches. And of course, um, the name of Arthur Eckstein uh, has to be dropped in this introduction because he was a great inspiration to you, Pierre Luc, um, which I saw uh, when you were hosting this wonderful lecture series last year in honor of Professor Arthur Eckstein, dedicated to well, Roman or Mediterranean foreign policy in the second century BCE. And Arthur was the first who systematically introduced uh, neorealist theory into an analysis of the Hellenistic Roman world, the rise of Rome in the third and early second centuries BCE, trying to, uh, to explain um, by drawing on the concepts of neorealism, neo um, why things happened as they happened and uh, that, we, that we can actually develop a, a, a much better and more solid understanding by applying this theory. So Arthur took um, his survey mainly to, uh, to uh, the Battle of uh, Magnesia and the Peace of Apamea, and this is largely your, the starting point of your book in which you try to bridge the next half century uh, in which Rome developed from just a leading power after say a confusion, if not partly a crush of the Hellenistic uh, world to the imperial leader uh, without alternative. So this highly interesting period of transition, which you have labeled as a period of uh, unipolarity, which is so interesting, not only for those who study Roman history, but also for what we are seeing in our own time uh, in the well, transition of the political world after the fall of the Iron Curtain around 1990. Um, and uh, well, there are many, many references that you make in your book. And uh, um, I guess there will also be some in your presentation and in the discussion. So I look forward very much to, to learning more from you this uh, this morning. Yeah, Luke, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, Alta. I just share my screen. Is that all good? Yes. And yes. I'll launch the diaporama. Even better. Even better. That's it. Um, thank you. Thank you, Altai, for this very uh, generous introduction. And thank you, Dr. Scullin, for um, inviting me to participate in the lecture, in the Seleucid uh, lecture series. And it is a real privilege to be uh, with you today. Um, and as a historian of the Roman Republic, I may be somewhat of an imposter among the speakers uh, who have already presented uh, in this series. However, um, any historian interested in Rome's political and military history in the second century BC will quickly have to deal with Rome's troubled relationship with the Hellenistic kingdoms, foremost among them, the kingdom of Pergamon and of course the Seleucid Empire. So today's presentation is partly drawn as you just uh, mentioned, Altai, partly drawn from the conclusions outlined in my monograph recently published in January in the Phoenix Supplementary Volumes under the title, Le Moment Unipolaire, Rome et la Méditerranée Hellenistique, the Unipolar Moment, Rome and the Hellenistic Mediterranean. So it is a unashamed uh, publicity for, uh, for the book. Um, so this book, which focuses on Rome's foreign policy in the first half of the second century, is in line with uh, the work of many Anglo-American scholars through its interdisciplinary approach. Of course, uh, 
the most prominent of these scholars being Arthur Eckstein. So my goal was to, under to understand the sometimes changing politics of Rome in this crucial period for the development of its empire and to do so with the help of modern theoretical tools. So between the defeat of King Antiochus the Great uh, and the brutal destruction of Corinth and Carthage in 146, the Mediterranean went through a unipolar moment of some 40 years during which Rome became the only superpower. Um, however, in my view, it is not enough to note this fact. It is necessary to show how, how this architecture of the Hellenistic system impacted some of its members. So today's talk with uh, today's talk will highlight how two Hellenistic kingdoms dealt with the power of the Roman Unipol. In short, how did King Eumenes II and Antiochus IV rule under Roman hegemony? How do, how do the events which occurred under the reign allow us to understand the constraints imposed by the new international order at the beginning of the second century BC? So first I will outline the theoretical aspects of international unipolarity and how it applies to the situation of Rome in the second century. And then I will look at the policies of Eumenes II and Antiochus IV at a particular moment, namely the years of the Third Macedonian War, which marked a critical turning point in the history of the ancient Mediterranean. So what I wish to show is that the action of these two kings allow us to make some general broad observations. On the one hand, uh, if Roman unipolarity considerably restricted the, capaci the capacity of action of the large Hellenistic kingdoms on the international scene, they did not seek any less to carry out a relatively autonomous policy, whether in Asia Minor or in the Levant. So it is a phenomenon that political scientists designate as leash slipping, to which we will return in time and place. And finally, and particularly in the case of Antiochus IV, uh, we will see how the traditions and pageantry of the Hellenistic monarchies provided him with the means of reaffirming the greatness of his dynasty and the power of his kingdom without posing a real threat to the international order established by Rome. So um, let's move on to uh, Roman unipolarity and Rome's unipolar moment. What do I mean by a uh, unipolar moment? So after the defeat of Antiochus III uh, at the Battle of Magnesia, Rome became truly the only superpower left in the Hellenistic world. Um, it is a communist opinion found among many scholars, um, and I quoted some of them. Um, for example, Guido Clemente wrote uh, in an important study published on Roman diplomacy in the page of Atinaium in 1976, uh, and I quote, uh, the new phase in the formation of Rome's foreign policy and the activity of its diplomacy was also conditioned, as it appears, by the new attitude of the Eastern states toward a now invincible power, an Italian dal nuovo atteggiamento degli stati orientali verso la potenza ormai invincibile. After the peace of Apamea, the Hellenistic world resorted to Rome as the natural arbiter of his dispute, come all'arbitro naturale delle sue dispute, providing with the necessary tools to implement tight control over local situations. The most active phase of this policy occurred between the years immediately following the Syrian war and the emergence of the Macedonian problem represented by Perseus. And he goes on, during this period, the Senate was the real center of international diplomacy, the vero centro della diplomazia internazionale, and it used, used all its tools. Um, most recently, another great scholar, the late uh, Jean-Louis Ferrari, 
came to the same conclusion in a paper published in 2003, in which he analyzed the complex and ambiguous relations between Rome and the Hellenistic sovereigns. And I quote, pendant le troisième siècle, les rapports entre Rome et les rois amis, les rois amis sont souvent difficiles à comprendre parce que Rome est ce que nous appelons une superpuissance et même la seule superpuissance dans un monde qui, en fait, avait cessé d'être multipolaire. Rome was the only superpower in a world which, in fact, had ceased to be multipolar. Donc, cesser d'être multipolaire dès les victoires successives de Sinocéphale et de Magnésie. In another study published in 2005, Ferrari returned again to this principle of Rome being the only superpower in the Mediterranean in the second century, asserting that the Roman Republic had a monopoly of the armed forces, or monopole des forces armées. This is only one of the few conclusions uh, on which Arthur Eckstein and William Harris agree, actually. Eckstein wrote in an article published in 2009, and I quote, the emergence of Rome as a true imperial metropole was haphazard and long delayed. After the defeat of Carthage, Macedon and the Seleucid Empire, Rome by 188 had certainly achieved what political scientists term unipolarity. In the Mediterranean state system, the preponderance of power was now in the hands of a single entity. For his part, William Harris wrote, after the defeat of Carthage and Annibal at Zama, there was no power anywhere in the Mediterranean that could stand up to a prolonged Roman onslaught. And in short order, the battles of Sinocephali, Mionysus, and Magnesia demonstrated Rome's superiority over the Macedonian and Seleucid monarchies. So the, the first quotation from Jean-Louis Ferrari is interesting for our purpose, since the French scholar use terminology specific to contemporary international relations when he referred to the Mediterranean multipolarity in favor of the rise in power of Rome. Uh, of course, Ferrari was writing barely 10 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and these notions of international bipolarity or, or multipolarity must have been very present in his mind. Now, if scholars agree on the fact that Rome was the only Hellenistic superpower after the Peace of Apamea, we still have to draw all the conclusions from that assessment. Indeed, a unipolar international system is not a system like any other. This particular configuration of international relations has consequences we must be fully aware of both for the unipole and for the minor and medium powers living under it. So the contemporary international system has not been the same since the beginning of the American unipolar moment in the mid 1990s, just as the Mediterranean was transformed by Roman unipolarity. So as some international relation theorists have shown, structures shape and show the behavior of international players. So therefore, to study the diplomatic interactions between Rome and the Hellenistic kingdoms is to study how historical, historical actors, such as Eumenes or Antiochus IV, influenced by their history and political traditions, responded to the pressure exerted by the international system uh, now dominated by Rome. Um, by definition, a unipolar system is an international system characterized by the presence of a sole great power, contrary to bipolar or multipolar systems. Yet, if the power of a unipole can obviously allow it to influence or even constrain all the other states in some way, its capacity is still not boundless. Unipolar systems are anarchic systems. Even though unipolarity establishes a more marked hierarchy between, state, between states, a unipole is not a world empire. It still evolves uh, within an international system where all the political players, uh, in our case, uh, Greek polis, leagues, kingdoms, where all political players are independent political entities. 
In this configuration of international politics, fear and uncertainty remain unavoidable elements which political actors need to deal with. Um, the Hellenistic world was in many ways a proto-diplomatic world. That is to say that despite the presence of international norms, the conclusion of treaties or the use of mediation means uh, well attested in the Mediterranean world, notably on the side of Rhodes, for example, uh, military force remain the ultimate means to settle any conflict, any quarrel. And contrary to what several political scientists had, ass had assumed, uh, namely that the emergence of a unipolar power could bring lasting peace to an international system, the Roman experience shows, on the contrary, that it might aggravate security concerns. Indeed, um, in the absence of another superpower to counterbalance the unipole, minor powers of the system are left alone to ensure their own security. In other words, balancing against Rome, against the Unipol, is difficult to implement in a unipolar system. The same is true for the Unipol. Although its position at the top of the international system may seem comfortable, extending the, co the scope of its responsibilities to all system regions will accentuate its security concerns. Clearly, inter unipolar systems are not systems without conflict. And the goal of each international player will be to find the right balance to evolve despite these systemic constraints. And the examples of the reign of Eumenes II and Antiochus IV allow us to assess this particular security dynamic. Um, so let's talk about Eumenes II. Let's move on to uh, the kingdom of Pergamon in the second century BC. Um, the case of the kingdom of Eumenes II is interesting in many ways. After the defeat of Antiochus III, and by the terms of the Treaty of Apamea, Asia Minor was henceforth dominated by the kingdom of Pergamon, which saw uh, its preceding status of minor power durably transformed. If the size of the territory uh, on which had reigned Attalus I was comparable with that of a Greek polis like Corinth, uh, the size of the kingdom on which reigned uh, his, his son Eumenes after Epame was considerably, uh, was considerable, sorry, and covered nearly 80,000 square kilometer. It's on, take a look, it's on the map on your right. You have two, uh, the two maps of the, the, the kingdom of Pergamon, before and after Epamea, and as you can see on the map on your on your right, uh, in the brown sections of the map, uh, the full extent of the kingdom of Epamea uh, in 185, so nearly three years after the Treaty of Epamea. So the constitution of the new Attalid state was, however, a unique process in history, uh, in the history of the Hellenistic world, uh, insofar as it proceeded as Peter Toneman underlined uh, it very precisely of an entirely external will. Rome rewarded thus one of its most faithful allies and the contemporaries understood well the nature of this gift and the debt that the Attila dynasty towards Rome. Humanus himself uh, seems to have recognized, uh, recognized this state of affairs around 188 as attested by the text of an inscription from Torion in Eastern Phrygia, in which the king grants the former military colony the status of polis. The king reaffirms there that it was possible for him to acquiesce to the request of the inhabitants of Torion, since he exercised, and I quote the inscription, he exercised unchallenged possession of the land, having received it from the Romans, who have prevailed in war and, th and through treaties, lines 20 to 22 uh, of this inscription. And it, it is possible to bring this inscription closer to another, which preserved the text of a decree of 182 returned by the Delphic Amphictyony 
uh, and confirming the isolampic nature of the Nikephoria celebrated in the Pergamon at Eumenes request. The Amphictyons stressed that, and I quote, the Romans seeing his policy have increased his kingdom, believing that all the kings who, who plot against the Greeks should meet the appropriate punishment, while those who have not been responsible for any evil deserve to enjoy the highest trust, line seven to 10 of the inscription. So during the, the years 180, um, Eumenes carried out a relatively autonomous policy in the shadow of the Roman uh, hegemony. And this is well studied uh, by, by Germain Payen in his monograph. In 186 and 186, to 186 uh, to 183, uh, Eumenes led a war against King Prusius of Bithynia for the control of a part of Phrygia granted to Pergamon by the Treaty of Apamea. Eumenes won the war and pushed back uh, the borders of his kingdom beyond those fixed by the peace treaty of 188. More important, however, was the war carried out by Eumenes against King Pharnaces I of Pontus from 182 to 179 uh, and his Galatian allies. So the will of expansion of the Pontic sovereign towards the Black Sea and the center of Anatolia quickly led it toward a confrontation with Pergamon. So despite the embassy sent to Italy by Eumenes, the Senate decided to send embassy to Asia without committing any troops on the ground to support his ally, to support Eumenes. It was alone without the support of the Romans that Pergamon and its allies had to lead war against Pharnaces. So the attitude of Rome towards Eumenes changed, changed drastically in the aftermath of the Third Macedonian War. Polybius attributed this change of attitude to the negotiations that Eumenes would have carried out near King Perseus to offer his mediation to put an end to the war. When Eumenes went to Italy in 167, so after the war, the Senate refused to receive him in 166, whereas the King of Pergamon carried out the war against the Galatians, the Senate recognized Galatia's independence, giving its ally a new diplomatic blow. So Polybius himself doubted the veracity of the secret negotiations carried out between Perseus and King Eumenes. It is, is it impossible to imagine that such negotiations could have taken place? In my opinion, it is quite possible that this could have happened. Uh, a peace negotiation negotiated between Rome and Macedonia, thanks to the mediation of Eumenes, would have ensured the preservation in Greece of a medium-sized power, which would have continued to divert from Asia the attention of the Roman while improving the diplomatic relations between Pergamon and the Macedonian court. In the event of the success of the mediation, Perseus would have found himself in debt to Eumenes. It, it would have also reinforced the position of the Attilid king and his prestige within the Greek world where the growth of Roman power continued to cause many concerns. Um, so it was undoubtedly a, a risky political bet for Eumenes, but a bet which was somewhat consistent with its policy of expansion carried out during the decades 180-170. Although Eumenes remained in debt to the Roman Senate, his alliance with Rome was not proved conclusive from a military point of view. He had to face alone King Prusius of Bithynia and, and lead without the military support of Rome, the coalition against Pharnaces of Pontus. In these two cases, the deference of Eumenes towards the Roman Senate caused him many diplomatic setbacks, which slowed down the war effort in Anatolia. Eumenes probably understood that the future of his kingdom depended on the reinforcement of its position in Anatolia and the continuation of an, of an autonomous foreign policy. Therefore, in my view, Eumenes tried to implement a policy of balancing toward Rome without engaging in a true military effort against the unipolar power to which he was still allied. 
contemporary political scientists designate this form of balancing as leash slipping. Uh, slipping. Contempor uh, the American political scientist Christopher Lane explained in the journal International Security the objective of pursuing a policy of leash slipping, in particular by looking at the policies of states confronted with American unipolarity. And I quote two excerpts uh, from Lane's uh, article. Uh, states engaging in leash slipping do not fear being attacked by the hegemon. Rather, they build up their military cap capabilities to maximize their ability to conduct an independent foreign policy. And again, by acquiring the cap capability to act independent of the United States or Rome, let's say for our purpose, in the realm of security, however, other states can slip free of the hegemon's leash-like grip and gain the leverage needed to compel the United States or Rome to respect their foreign policy interests. Um, and now I wish to, uh, to move on to Antiochus IV, uh, our Seleucid king, uh, because the case of Antiochus IV provides another interesting example of how the Hellenistic powers try to maneuver within uh, Roman unipolarity. Um, as you probably well know, Antiochus had a singular life that you undoubtedly uh, know well. He was sent as a political hostage to Rome after the defeat of his father, Antiochus the Great, and remained in Italy for about 10 years before settling in Athens. He ascended the Seleucid throne after the assassination of his brother Seleucus IV in the autumn of 175. He had received uh, in his quest to the throne the support of King Eumenes II, whereas his nephew, Prince Demetrius, the future Demetrius I, was retained in Rome as a hostage. Thus, uh, the Romans came to create two competing lineages within the Seleucid dynasty. Uh, it was also a clever political move, a uh, diplomatic move on behalf of King Eumenes, which came to detach from the Seleucid kingdom, uh, which came, sorry, to detach the Seleucid kingdom from its alliance with Macedonia. Of course, Seleucus, uh, Seleucus IV had married a Macedonian princess. So while the war was raging in Macedonia, a new conflict broke out in 170 between the Seleucid kingdom and the alleged kingdom of Egypt at the instigation of the court of Alexandria. Uh, the Seleucid forces quickly had the upper hand over the Egyptian troops. In 169, Antiochus conquered the city of Pelusium in the Eastern Nile Delta, giving him a strategic point from which to conduct further incursions into Egypt. In 169, Antiochus also the siege of Alexandria before retreating to Syria in the fall. He returned the following year in 168, in addition to conquering the highland of Cyprus. It is possible that the Seleucid king was also crowned pharaoh in the second half of 168. In any case, he conquered a good part of the Lagid kingdom and made a second siege of Alexandria. It is there, uh, in the city of Eleusis that the Roman ambassador Caius Popilius Linus founded. It is, a fam it is um, an episode which you are all familiar with, of course. After drawing a circle around him, Linus ordered Antiochus to lift the siege of the Lagid capital and seize the war against his nephews. And Polybius relates how Antiochus yielded to the request of the Romans. The king was astonished uh, at this authoritative proceeding, but after a moment's hesitation, said he would do all that the Romans demanded. Upon this, Popilius and his suite, and his suite all grasped him with the hand and greeted him warmly. The latter ordered him to put an end at once to the war with Ptolemy. So, as a fixed number of days were allowed to him, he led his army back to Syria, deeply are hurt and complaining indeed, but yielding to circumstances for the present, circumstances being the defeat 
of King Perseus at Pydna in 168. And indeed, uh, in Greece, Aemilius Paulus celebrated his victory over Macedonia by organizing great athletic contests, just like a Hellenistic sovereign in the town of Amphipolis. These competitions opened to the whole of the Greeks and had such a reper repercussions that Polybius affirms that they caused the envy of Antiochus to surpass them. And I quote, the same king Antiochus, when he heard of the games celebrated in Macedonia by Jaime dos Paulus, the Roman general, ambitious of surpassing Paulus in magnificence, sent out embassies and sacred missions to the towns to announce the games he was about to give at Daphne, so that people in Greece were very eager to visit Antioch then. Um, the festivities occurred at Daphne in Syria in 166. Also, although uh, this date has recently been questioned, um, most particularly by Panagiotis Yosif. Um, the celebrations, which probably took place within the context of a local festival dedicated to Apollo, began with a great military parade, gathering tens of thousands of soldiers and mercenaries coming from the territories under Seleucid domination. Uh, the king wanted to give these festivities hel held every three years a Panhellenic dimension by dispatching Theoroi to the Greek cities and holding athletic competitions and sumptuous banquets that lasted over 30 days. The wealth of Antiochus was thus exposed in all aspects uh, of the festivities. So although the, the military power of the Seleucid kingdom was left rather intact after the Syrian conflict, uh, Antiochus's prestige could only have faded in the eyes of the Greek world. Uh, the king had shown a certain political sense by preserving his cool uh, during the fateful day of Eleusis and avoided a confrontation with Linus and Rome. However, he could only perceive as an affront to his royal dignity, the injunction of Linus. So the failure of his Egyptian campaign could have weakened his position, not only near the Greeks, uh, whom Antiochus had put so much energy in charming in the previous years by, for example, by lavish donations to Athens, but also uh, had certainly weakened his position within his vast kingdom, which remained prone to internal disorders, particularly in its Eastern provinces. So Antiochus's power, like any Hellenistic sovereign was based on a charismatic type of domination. Even though the outcome of the sixth Syrian war against Egypt represented a reversal, Antiochus could nevertheless capitalize on his victories against the Lagid forces in the first year of the conflict, in addition to the impressive spoils of war taken in Egypt and which later financed the festivities of Daphne. So it is in the wake of these festivities, we should also consider the exceptional emission of gold statters on which, appear, uh, on which the king appears on the obverse, uh, a portrait of Antiochus, and on the reverse, the image of Zeus on his throne bearing the legend Basileos Antiochutheu Epiphanus Nikephoru. Um, it is moreover at the same time that appears on the Seleucid uh, monetary issues the epithet Nikephoros, uh, bearer of victory, whereas the goddess Nike, Nike, who appears on the reverse uh, by the side of Zeus, now turn towards the outside, contrary to preceding issues, and seems to crown the king on the obverse of the coin. The, the propagandistic scope of this issue was undoubtedly aimed at reinforcing Antiochus's prestige as a military leader, transforming the Egyptian campaign into a victorious expedition. So the military parade 
and the festivities of Daphne were thus to serve a double objective, both internal and external uh, to the Seleucid kingdom. It reinforced the charismatic dimension of Antiochus's power on the world stage. It restored the position of the Seleucid kingdom as a power that mattered, um, a fact remains, which could not have escaped any foreign observer at the time, Antiochus had to cave before a Roman ambassador, whereas he held uh, the military advantage on the ground. In truth, Antiochus had not only a very lucid reading of the political position of his kingdom, but he had undoubtedly understood that the day after Aemilus Paulus's victory at Pydna, the adoption of a policy of prestige of grandeur remained the only tool left still at his disposal to restore his position towards the Roman unipole. It was in short about leash slipping again, but on a diplomatic symbolic uh, level. Not only the Seleucid, the Seleucid kingdom, the Seleucid king did not intend to hide the treasures brought back from Egypt uh, or his military power, his military might, but on the contrary, he had to expose them to his people and the Greek ambassadors who answered his invitation. If Antiochus recognized the preponderance of the Roman unipole, he could not ensure in the long run, he could not be ensured in the long run of the friendly dispositions of the senators towards him. More especially has his nephew, the young Prince Demetrius remain hostage in Rome and could be used if needed for political leverage. So in these circumstances, and while maintaining his friendly relationship with Rome, Antiochus had to reaffirm the political influence of his dynasty and show that a repetition of the Battle of Pydna could not easily occur under his reign in Syria. So Antiochus's foreign policy, which sought to improve the position of his kingdom while recognizing at the same time the preponderance of the Roman unipole, testified in my view to his great diplomatic intelligence and his political skill. Uh, the Roman embassy dispatched in the East the day after the festivities of Daphne shows well that the Senate was still regarding Syria as an important political player uh, on the Hellenistic chessboard, uh, an important politi political player in the East. So the capacity of Antiochus to reassure the Roman ambassadors made it possible to avoid a useless escalation of the tensions between the Romans and the Seleucid kingdom. Nevertheless, Antiochus achieved his goal. From the diplomatic point of view, Antiochus's policy uh, made marvel. Uh, it was not work of a deranged sovereign, uh, a sovereign, but that of a realistic monarch, uh, pragmaticus, according to Diodorus, who had taken the full measures, the full measure of the changes caused by the establishment of Roman hegemony since the defeat of his father at Magnesia. And the sudden death of Antiochus in 164, followed by the ascension to the throne of a child of hardly 10 years, the young Antiochus V, and the tough foreign policy then implemented by Rome proved well the need for Epiphanes' policy of grandeur after Pydna. As Apian, Apian summarized it, the Senate, and I quote, the Senate rejoiced that Antiochus had shown only a little time his valorous na nature and had died quickly. So after, after having looked at the cases of Eumenes II and Antiochus IV, it would seem appropriate to meet in the conclusion of this presentation to widen our perspective and to try to draw some general conclusions on the Roman policy towards uh, the Hellenistic powers in the years 160 BC. So in my opinion, it is necessary to nuance the studies that judge the policy of the Senate, the Roman policy, to be of colossal indifference 
and apathetic. These are words uh, used by uh, Eric Gruen, for example. Um, why did the Hellenistic kings go to so much trouble to obtain the recognition and the military and political support of the Roman senators if the Senate was disinterested in the affairs of the Greek world? Nevertheless, it is necessary to recognize the Senate's great reluctance to engage troops to support the implementation of its decision, of its decisions concerning the Eastern affairs or to punish the kings who may disregard of its opinions and try to pursue an independent foreign policy such as Humanist II and Antiochus IV. However, one should, in my view, distinguish the aims of Rome's foreign policy and the means the Senate has chosen to achieve them. In other words, a great power such as Rome can have a revisionist foreign policy aiming to transform the geopolitical landscape to its advantage without committing troops on the ground if it judges that its policy influence, its, its political influence will be sufficient to make its, its opinions prevail. This is a matter of judgment, good or wrong, but not of intent. It would not be the first time, nor the last, that a great power failed to act according to its own commitment. Barack Obama once drew a red line in the sand concerning the use of chemical weapons in Syria, but failed to act when the Assad regime disregarded it. Donald Trump once promised fire and fury against North Korea, but never took any military action against the Pyongyang regime. Nevertheless, I would not describe these presidents as apathetic or disinterested in Eastern affairs. Instead, they realized, as for Syria, that America's position in the world was not endangered by the genocidal actions of Bashar al-Assad. The policy implemented by Rome, by the Roman Senate, proved to be coherent in many respects, aiming not at ensuring the stability of the Hellenistic East, but to revise, when the occasion presented itself, the international status quo in order to reinforce Rome's hegemonic position. The policy proved, this policy proved to be opportunistic, trying to benefit from the Eastern monarchy's dynastic quarrels to weaken their position. Polybius underlined this opportunism, particularly when analyzing the Egyptian affairs, which were out of the scope of uh, today's presentation. But he wrote, nevertheless, for very many decisions of the Romans are of this kind, that is opportunistic. Availing themselves of the mistakes of others, they effectively increase and build up their own power at the same time doing a favor and appearing to confer a benefit on the offenders. Polybius's judgment on the Senate's foreign policy and Roman policy in general in the decade, in the decade of 160 is not entirely negative, he uses the adverb pragmaticos uh, to characterize the Senate's action. On the contrary, Polybius deplores the errors, agnoias in Greek, and the inability of the Greeks to ensure the stability of their states and their tendency to unnecessarily compromise their auto autonomy by seeking the arbitration of Rome. So in reality, uh, before committing significant resources to its foreign policy, any great power analyze, analyzes at the political, human, and financial costs of a new armed intervention. However, the quarrel between the kings of Pontus and Pergamon, for example, over the control of Cappadocia, didn't justify that the Senate chartered a fleet, mobilized legions in the east, and the declared war on the stubborn kings. In the absence of a direct threat to the Italian peninsula and considering the weak prospects of enrichment, the idea of engaging in these distant border quarrels would undoubtedly have had little chance to carry the, adhes the adhesion of the Roman assemblies. At the same time, 
Rome was engaged in military operations in Northern Italy and Spain without speaking about the new troubles in North Africa, which monopolized the Senate's attention and mobilized the state's resources. Above all, these regions had a strategic interests much more critical for the safety of the Italian peninsula. The Anatolian quarrels in which Eumenes II was engaged, as for them, had little chance to upset the distribution of power within the Hellenistic system and this strategic appreciation on, on behalf of the Senate. Oh. <laughs> Someone has his mic open. So the Anatolian quarrels, I was saying, has little chance to upset the distribution of power within the Hellenistic system. And this strategic appreciation on behalf of the Senate left the Eastern powers such as Pergamon or the Seleucid kingdom relatively autonomous in the conduct of their foreign policy. If the Eastern kings yielded to the injunction of the Senate, Rome's position would be reinforced. If on the contrary, the kings refused to accede to the requests of the Senate, that had a little chance to involve an important transformation of the, of the distribution of power in the East. The Senate could always wait that the problem of succession to the throne arises again. The senatorial appellatio had become a diplomatic unction necessary for the Hellenistic sovereigns, just like for the the usurpers uh, to the throne. Rome had understood pretty well the profit it could draw to feed the, dis the political disorders within the Eastern kingdoms without extending its support beyond the simple diplomatic recognition, nor to engage any legion east of the Adriatic. It was diplomatic posturing for sure, but it was not devoid of any efficiency. International relations scholars speak about delegation or buck passing to characterize a strategy where a great power such as Rome, if refusing to engage in a war actively, makes sure to feed the conflict by supporting a coalition against a potential adversary. The usurpation of Alexander Ballas in 158, for example, supported by the kingdom of Egypt and Pergamon, provides a good example of such a strategy. International relations scholars also talk of bloodletting to refer to a policy that consists in supporting one of the both camps in war so that each one inflicts a maximum of losses. In short, for Rome, it was a policy of revision at a lower cost, which was not without strategic advantages. And finally, I wish to end this conclusion with a question. The question of why. If one can understand the strategic motivations that pushed the Roman Senate to engage in the dynastic quarrels of the great Hellenistic kingdoms, the Lagic kingdom of this, or the Seleucid kingdom, it is difficult to understand the reasons that pushed kings and usurpers alike to request with such regularity the anointing given by the Senate. It is certainly hard to understand, considering that the Senate was reluctant to support their allies' claim militarily. On the one hand, the answer to this question undoubtedly lies in the charismatic nature of royal power, and on the other hand, in the systemic constraints which reduced the capacity of action of the Hellenistic kingdoms. Indeed, as you all know, Hellenistic royal legitimacy rested on the capacity of the sovereign, the king, uh, or the would-be king to show that he was able to preserve, even to increase his inherited kingdom. However, how could the Hellenistic kings establish their legitimacy in the eyes of their subjects if their military ambitions were restricted by the hegemonic position acquired by Rome on the Mediterranean scene? The senatorial recognition beyond the strategic objectives of the sovereigns became a way of capturing a part of the prestige acquired by the Roman Senate in the years that followed the defeat of the great kings, such as Philip V, Antiochus III, or Perseus. The Romans had become the rulers of the worlds, equal to the gods, and their anointing could thus become a powerful 
propaganda tool for sovereigns with limited action capabilities. In this context, it is quite natural that the Romans, in the eyes of the Greeks, uh, took on the title of universal benefactors and of common benefactors, Romaioi, oi konoi, koinoi, oergetai, that's present in many inscriptions, uh, a, a title formerly claimed by the great Hellenistic kings. This title of universal benefactors used in decrees and inscriptions came to reaffirm, as it were, Rome's position as the only superpower in the Hellenistic world. Finally, the second part of the answer rests on the security preoccupation of Hellenistic leaders. Indeed, one must consider the uncertainty principle that was still prevalent in the Mediterranean system, even despite the hegemonic position of the Roman unipole, if not because of it, the Senate had not hesitated to intervene militarily when it felt that the vital interests of Rome were at stake. Rome had outrooted the Macedonian monarchy in 168, and that event certainly had a great impact on the international stage. Certainly it had for an observer such as Polybius, for example. Hellenistic leaders had to choose whether or not they were willing to call Rome's bluff. Uh, despite having conquered much of Egypt, Antiochus IV decided that he was not willing to call the bluff and retreated to his kingdom after the infamous day of Eleusis. Another, another example of such political calculation and security uncertainty is provided by the letter uh, written by King Eumenes' successor, Attalus II, which was sent in 156 to Attis, high priest of Pessinus. This um, well-known document um, offers a rare look into the negotiations which had course within the king's council. Attalus affirms that the opinion of his close advisors were divide, was divided on the policy to follow against the Galatians. One of them, a man named Chlorus, was, and I quote, extremely insistent in emphasizing the Roman factor and advising that in no way should anything be done without consulting them. Attalus finally followed his advice, and I quote again, at first, few shared his point of view, but after this, as we kept exam examining the the matter day after day, his advice made a greater impression on us. And to go ahead without consulting them seemed to involve considerable danger, megas kindunos in Greek. If successful, the result would be jealousy, displeasure, and hostile suspicion as they had felt towards my brother, that is King Eumenes. Eumenes. And if we fail, certain destruction. In sum, if the Senate had shown itself unwilling to back up its injunctions with the force of its legions, a factor of uncertainty remained with which the vis-a-vis -vis of Rome had to deal with. Rome's foreign policy had often appeared contradictory, disembodied, disinterested, and has long puzzled uh, modern scholars. This policy was undoubtedly all this at the same time. International relations both ancient and contemporary, often involve a great deal of posturing indeed. The road to world empire was not an easy and straightforward path as the messy diplomatic relations of the, of the second century has shown. But nevertheless, Rome was ready to back its diplomatic posturing when the senators felt they needed to. In the years 190 against Philip V and Antiochus III, in the years 170 against King Perseus, and in the years 150 against the revival of the Carthaginian economy. There are only two roads for a unipolar power to follow. Whether international unipolarity transforms into multipolarity with the rise of another powers, great power. Uh, this is a phenomenon we are witnessing today with the rise of China, or the unipolar power becomes a world empire. 
durably transforming international relations. And Rome was to follow this second path. Thank you all very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward for uh, Germain's response and your question, of course. We, we'd like to thank Pierre. That was wonderful in every way. We, we all thank him for that very lucid and um, streamlined presentation. Um, I see there's people who have their hands, little hands clapping. So that's, you will have to accept that as, as a plug. <laughs> sure. um, we're calling on Germain now. He's a teacher in ancient history at Lille University. He conducted a postdoctoral fellowship in Cologne, Germany, after gaining his PhD at the University of Sorbonne and at the University of Laval in Quebec and holding a first postdoctoral position at the University of Waterloo, Ontario. His research interests range from Hellenistic kingdoms and Anatolian geopolitics and Roman expansion in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Black Sea, and the Bosporan Kingdom in the Roman Imperial per period to Judean politics during Seleucid and Roman domination. He has published various articles on the dynastic politics in Asia Minor and the Bosporan mm -hmm. Kingdom. And I'm going to blow the pronunciation, but I'm going to try anyway. His most important publication to date is the book on is the book on Les Suites Géopolitiques du Traité de Pamé on Anatole, uh, published in Quebec 2020. We're calling on Germain. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Pierre-Luc, for this uh, very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm particularly interested by the use of this interdisciplinary approach uh, using uh, modern uh, international theories uh, uh, for ancient history. Um, very useful, I think, and it was already the case with uh, Exchange's uh, studies, but also uh, in, the, in your presentation uh, to better understand Rome and how Rome came to become, uh, well, the one major power in the in the well, not the Hellenistic in the Mediterranean world uh, at the end of the first century or even as you say beginning or half of the second century BC, while it was almost an unknown actor for Hellenistic actors in the third century BC, so that it's something that happened well quite fast actually even though yeah, decades or centuries, of course, are not that fast for people at the moment. Um, very um, interesting in this transition period because um, there was first multipolarity uh, before, man, uh, well, before the second uh, Macedonian war, then bipolarity, which, which only lasted for a very few years, uh, until the Battle of Manisia, as you said earlier, then unipolarity. But these transitions are maybe even geopolitical shifts. It's a bit too fast to talk about transition, really. But then after that, for years or even decades, there was a period of transition that uh, put every everyone and every king uh, be, be, before the reality of this new geopolitical uh, uh, situation. And I would like to come back to what you said at the beginning of your presentation about uh, Rome becoming the center of, of Hellenistic diplomacy just after uh, Manisia, just after the Treaty of Apamea, and being really the center of diplomacy in these first years uh, from uh, 188 to 172. Um, which is interesting because it there is even in this short period of uh, less well of um, 16 uh, 16 years there is also an evolution at first and you quoted two very important interesting uh, inscriptions uh, the Eumenes the second and the um, Achaean uh, uh, no not the Achaean, the Aetolian, uh, uh, the Aetolian League were we're not afraid to say that the Roman power was the one, uh, the, the one uh, um, superpower, and that something emanating from it was above everything else. Um, but I think that 
and you sort of said it too, uh, this idea or this uh, feeling maybe fade out a little bit uh, in the 180s and 170s because of the lack of uh, military uh, intervention uh, in, uh, in, in Greece and in Asia Minor in, in, this, uh, in these years. So that's interesting because then uh, when they, they came back for the third Macedonian war, and uh, and and that uh, the the other powers, the ancient allies, especially Rhodes and the Atalid Kingdom, uh, felt the backlash uh, of their supposed lack of uh, commitment, of yeah. zeal, yeah. of zeal for Roman uh, uh, alliance. Uh, they yeah they reminded everyone that they were the one uh, big power uh, in the place. So that's a uh, something interesting and what you said at the end on why uh, the question why do all these uh, powers came to rome uh, to be uh, recognized uh, all the time and to have the roman uh, um, how do you say um uh, unction you know uh, yeah they were yeah, they were anointing benediction. Kings. yeah, yeah uh, benediction. benediction yeah for yeah for, well uh, and that's the almost the one of the first things you said in your your introduction F fear and uncertainty did play their their role because maybe if you didn't do that well nine times out of ten nothing would happen but one time out of ten you do not exist anymore so were you willing something. to bet yeah <laughs> yeah very very interesting uh, approach uh, about uh, about humanness the second uh, who was in, in fact, uh, yeah, as you said, uh, dominant by external will, by Roman will. So that's uh, something very rare, almost um, maybe unique at the time, at least. Uh, there seemed to be a change of attitude after, for me, the Third Macedonian War, mm -hmm. uh, because well, the little uh, um, little passage you you quoted from Attalus, uh, uh, you were speaking to Atis. And saying yeah. that he would take uh, the Roman uh, Roman uh, uh, council or uh, sake Rome everything that he would do or he would try to do uh, all the time, that would come just after uh, the Roman uh, uh, the Roman threat. Well, would say something like that. Or Roman declaration of Galatian independence and everything uh, just after uh, Pydna. Mm -hmm. So that was a time like just after the battle of Magnesia, when the roman threat was really felt uh, in uh, in uh, east in the east but some years after that atalos did a bit like humanness before him and conducted his own foreign policy mostly without well taking well not too much into account uh, roman uh, roman uh, advice so there are always this uh, thing of change and uh, uh, Rome intervenes and everyone just do as Rome says and then they do not intervene for a couple of years and kingdoms tend to uh, take their distance uh, with uh, Roman interests. Not too much, of course, but to a certain uh, extent. Um, and what did I want to say to you? Uh, Oh yeah, the uh, one uh, other thing, maybe yeah, maybe the last thing I will say right now to let you uh, answer uh, about the festival, the festivities of Daphne uh, in uh, one sixty six, uh, and you and, and I agree with you. Uh, you talked about the question of dignity of uh, internal credibility also, also uh, because the king uh, had to uh, re-establish his own charisma in his. Uh, in his kingdom, well, this uh, policy of prestige uh, that you consider to be uh, maybe the only possibility for uh, for the kingdoms who were well, who were uh, who could not compete with Rome anymore and who could not really conduct a uh, policy a policy of uh, conquest uh, that would not be uh, in Roman favor. Well, that is all. That is also very uh, visible for smallest kingdoms or smaller kingdoms such as a uh, comagine uh with uh, antiochus the first of, of comagine 
who really uh, created a sort of uh, cult, a royal cult, very, very, uh, very, uh, very important royal cult in his very small kingdom in Armenia, which was a uh, uh, minor power, uh, maybe a middle power, but uh, never something really important or dominant in his in his region, but was the most uh, well, the most divine figure, at least in the in the uh, development of the Hellenistic uh, ruler cult, which is uh, interesting for a small and um, unimportant power. And oh uh, yeah, last thing. Um, also about the there is not maybe only this policy of prestige because at the end of his rule, Antiochus the fourth and all the kings after him uh, tried to re uh, reconquer uh, the eastern uh, mm -hmm. provinces of the kingdom, and that brings uh, the the um, the problem of the Parthian, the Avathid kingdom. So it's always very difficult to differentiate in, in uh, Seleucid history what is due to Romans, what is due to other seeds in their fall. Because of course, all of our sources, or 90% of our sources, uh, do <laughs> are very uh, Roman or Greek, but see more the Romans than the, the Persians. But actually, most of the military setbacks were due to the other seats and not the Romans. So did the new unipolar uh, system created the means for this to happen? Uh, or was it uh, really, uh, well, what was the part of Roman, uh, of uh, Roman, uh, uh, how say, uh, how was Roman responsible for uh, the Seleucid decline uh, compared to uh, the other seats? Uh, actually, that's, uh, yeah, well, I'm gonna stop here and let you speak. Uh, merci, uh, merci, Germain. Uh, well, um, when I said that prestige was the only tool left um, for the Seleucid monarchy in, in, under Roman hegemony or Roman unipolarity, it was the only tool left as far as the Mediterranean world was concerned, as far as the Greek world was concerned. You know, um, I don't I don't think that many senators uh, in Rome cared about what was happening in the very far eastern provinces of the Seleucid Empire. Um, they, what they cared about was the Mediterranean world, the Greek world. So yes, prestige, but prestige uh, as a tool as far as the Greek world, the Greek world was concerned. Uh, as for the stability of the Seleucid Empire and Roman unipolarity, well, I, I think that the Roman, uh, the Romans played a very important part in the demise uh, of the uh, of the Seleucid Empire, just by introducing this competition between two uh, different lineages uh, within the, yeah. Seleucid, uh, the Seleucid monarchy, the Seleucid dynasty. You know? Your stage policy. Uh, uh, the Romans understood that, and I think that they understood, this is my guess, the Roman understood that Hellenistic kingdoms were fragile, were prone to internal turmoils, uh, around the, the the notion of the ex the, the the accession to the throne, uh, the Romans tried to play a talus against his brother Eumenes after the the Battle of Pydna. They tried to sow dissent within the Helen the uh, the um, the monarch the the dynastic house uh, in Pergamon. They maintained this division within the Seleucid house, uh, the Seleucid dynasty by keeping Demetrius in Rome. Uh, and on, on that point, uh, I must disagree with uh, Eric Gruen who once wrote that in his view, the fact that the Romans refused to send Demetrius home was a way to maintain the stability of the Seleucid Empire. To the contrary, I mean, if if a if a king such as Antiochus the third or a king such as Antiochus the fourth had difficulties to 
maintain his position as king within his kingdom, particularly regarding the eastern provinces of the Seleucid Empire, how do how a boy king of Tan could maintain the stability of his empire uh, without that legitimacy uh, upon which rested uh, uh, rested the Hellenistic monarchy? Um, so, in my view, the Romans much more feared the fact that Demetrius became become king in, in Syria much more than they feared uh, that uh, Seleucus V be maintaining power. Um, what I wish to, um, what I wish to outline, uh, also another fact, we were talking about 168 um, and the fact that by 168, there seems to be a shift in the attitudes of the Greeks toward Rome. Well, I think that the Jean-Louis Ferrari well put it uh, in an article a few years ago when he wrote that uh, in 168, what truly changed was, was not the, um, um, the architecture of the Hellenistic system. What truly changed was that the Greeks finally realized what had happened in 188, you know? Uh, Polybius, for Polybius, 168 is a real turning point. Huh? For, for Polybius, 168 is a date uh, by which Roman domination was now, uh, was now a, an accomplished fact. But that was the case 20 years before in 188. What truly changed in 168 is the, Greek fi the Greeks finally realized that, well, the Romans are, are ready to implement um, very drastic measures in order to maintain their status. Um, so 168 is a, is a very interesting date. This is why I ended my book not in 168, but in 146. For me, 146 is a much more interesting date concerning Roman unipolarity, because by 146, not only did the Roman intervened in the affairs of the Greek world, they decided to destroy, eliminate political player in the international system and to annex, to imperialize regions of the Hellenistic system, which they did not had, uh, which they, they refused to do before. Of course, they, they conquered uh, Sicily uh, after, after the, the, the first Punic War, but they refrained annexing Macedonia after the, the, the second uh, Macedonian war. They refrained annexing uh, North Africa after um, the second Punic war. So 146 is really a turning point for me because from that point on, uh, the very structure of the international Hellenistic system was profoundly transformed. The Romans were eliminating international players and annexing new territory. So by 146, in my view, there's a, an imperial threshold that was, that was passed by, uh, by the Romans. There were no coming back after, after 146. So this is why it's the end date uh, of, my, of my book. And finally, maybe a last point on international unipolarity, you, you referred to the fact that I use modern um, theoretical tools. Um, I'm, I'm very fond of Raymond Aron, the, the French uh, political scientist Raymond Aron, who once wrote in the 60s that anyone doing uh, international relation history or diplomatic history must engage into a sociological inquiry. It is one thing to understand what were the, the, uh, the systemic constraints uh, of a given system. It's another thing to understand how international players, actors reacted to these constraints. And international players react to systemic constraints in various ways based on their historical development, their own culture, their own institutions. Of course, the Carthaginians did not react in the same way that the great Hellenistic kings reacted because their political institutions and their historical development was, were quite different. So this is what I, for me was the most important thing. It was to show how these constraints, which Raymond Aron described as the um, the conditions structurelles de la bellicosité, the, the structural conditions of bellicosity, 
uh, played differently when looking at the various actors of the international system. As you well know, the, um, the danger when applying such uh, structural theories is to um, reify international players. You know, all international players are not alike. They are not billiard balls uh, moving uh, on the uh, on the chessboard of the Hellenistic system, they had their own history, their own culture, their own traditions, and this is something that we must take into account when dealing with international relation history or diplomatic history. Uh, I hope that answers your uh, your 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 question or your remark. So. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, to uh, rebound from that yeah. <laughs> uh, about your your uh, word on uh, Demetrius on. Uh, Rome delivering uh, the ten-year-old uh, king, uh, king wannabe. Uh, yeah. the, the, uh, another thing that uh, this um, interdisciplinary approach uh, permits it's uh, to have a new way to uh, reason in the debate between uh, offensive and defensive imperialism yes. uh, for uh, Rome uh, in the Hellenistic world, which is uh, something that is disputed for now. Yeah, of course, and some somehow my book is a is a is in line with the defensive approach of Roman imperialism, and this is what um, the theory of international unipolarity allows me to do. Um, I based my work on a study published in 2014, uh, written by a Yale scholar whose name was. Uh, Nuno Montero, I said was because he died, uh, unfortunately, a few years ago. Uh, um, Montero was part of my PhD jury, but he wrote in 2014 uh, a book called entitled A um, Theory of International of Unipolar Politics or something like that, uh, in which he showed that um, contrary to what the common opinion was within uh, the IR community, international unipolarity was not a guarantee of pacifying an international system. Um, and the example of the US after the fall of the USSR is quite telling, you know, the United States were engaged into wars uh, continually after the mid 1990s. So international unipolarity does not equate peace within an international system. And these systemic, that systemic insecurity the, uh, goes both ways. For the minor powers who are not confronted to the unipolar power, but also uh, the unipolar power who must now supervise, deal with the older regions of the international system. Uh, and this is why I think that this theory of international politics help us better understand what were really truly the security constraints that the Roman Senate was uh, going through uh, during that period. It, it's not because you are a unipolar power that you necessarily feel uh, safe. To the contrary, you tend to see enemies everywhere. Um, so, and I think that that explain in part the reactions of Rome, the revival of the Macedonian monarchy in the city in the in 170 uh, BC, where it explains also the, the, the reaction of Rome uh, in face of the, the economic revival of Carthage uh, in the 150 uh, in the 150 BC. I think it, it could even uh, explain other things after the realization of the unipolar moment, after 146 when uh, uh, Mithridates in the Pontus or uh, Tigranes uh, in Armenia uh, started their own imperialistic mm -hmm. uh, policies uh, when they had to create their own security in the face of Roman and, as I said, uh, rights. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. We'd like to thank both of you for this stimulating uh, conversation. Are there people who have questions? I'm sure that Altai and I have questions, but before we jump in, are there people who would like to make a comment or ask anything of either of our speakers? Lorenzo. Uh, good morning. Thank you for, uh, for this possibility. And I, I wanted to ask uh, um, something about the, what the, the Romans thought about uh, 
the Hellenistic armies, what was their think uh, over uh, their, military, their military capabilities of the Hellenistic army? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, most, most certainly when assessing what a unipolar power is, you need to assess what were the capabilities of the unipolar power versus the capabilities of his adversaries. Uh, and I devoted a full chapter in my book uh, uh, to that assessment. And I think that what distinguishes uh, Roman, the Roman army from the Hellenistic army, armies, um, it's not a matter of um, organization. It's not a matter of uh, technique or tactics. It's the fact that the Romans, contrary to the great Hellenistic monarchies, were able to wage war of attrition. Uh, they did not. They did not rely on uh, mercenaries to field their armies. They relied on a very ingenious and efficient system of diplomatic alliances in Italy, known as the Formula Togatorum, which allowed them. Uh, to field continuously field armies if needed from their former Italian foes who were now bound to Rome by formal treaties. So what distinguishes in my view, uh, these two armies what was that capacity to wage war of attrition on the long, uh, on the long run. Uh, and this is why in my view, Rome had a clear advantage over Hellenistic monarchies. Of course, um, the Macedonian army was not an army of mercenaries, but the capabilities of the Macedonian army to, to field armies uh, which were much more limited uh, contrary to the Romans. Yeah, yeah in the ancient sources, the numbers, well, they cannot always be followed, but the numbers are usually about the same for Roman and Hellenistic armies that uh, face uh, each other, even usually a bit more numerous for the Hellenistic side, even Macedonia in the Pydna battle. But when they lost one, bat one big battle, they just lost the war, which was not the case of Rome. Exactly, That's exactly. The... Uh, and there's a very famous excerpt from uh, Plutarch's life of Pyrrhus, uh, when one of uh, Pyrrhus's uh, counselor uh, says that, um, when fighting the Roman armies is like fight, fighting an Idra, you know, you cut one head and there's another that grow up, you know, uh, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the same thing. Okay, are there other questions? Uh, in, in, in that case, um, Pierre, if I could uh, um, give you a, a quibble and a question. Um, <laughs> sure. The quibble is when you were talking about the Sixth Syrian War, mm -hmm. you called it a failure, but then you, you explain how Antiochus spun it. Um, but it wasn't really a failure, was it? Um, in other words, I, I see that it, it called that all the time, but it was, he had two successful invasions, um, conquered nearly all of Egypt, could have conquered Alexandria too. Um, and like you say, he came back with a lot of spoils. Not every war has to be for conquest and annexation. So I wonder if it really was a failure. That's my quibble. My, 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 my question is, when I study the, the deliberations of the senators about these different uh, foreign uh, entanglements or relationships, I don't see any factions or mm -hmm. ideologies. I see a bunch of guys sitting around ad hoc, a la carte, right, trying to figure out what they want to do here and what they want to do there. Am, am yep. I wrong or are there, I mean, sometimes I'll see like a Scipio faction or something, but in general, I don't see say an imperialistic wing back in the period that you're talking about. Later on, of course, as you said, everything changes. And that change is a very interesting development. And I think you're quite right to emphasize that. But in the period we're talking about, say the 170s, the 160s, I don't see you know, any wings, factions, movements, parties to you? No, I, I, I do agree with you. And that analysis was based on prosopographic analysis that are now much outdated, you know. Right. Uh, and, and when we are talking about 
the, the Senate's policy as if the Senate was a monolithic block, uh, all thinking the same. Uh, well, we're talking about a policy that was achieved through debates and, and consensus. Of course, everyone could not agree on everything, uh, but nevertheless, there were all landowners um, that were preoccupied with Rome's place in Italy and the Mediterranean world. And I do not see uh, any clear faction, no. Um, as, for the, uh, as for the goals of, of Antiochus IV, um, if, if I was to follow your, your analysis, if the goal was not to conquer Egypt, uh, why, why laying siege uh, to Alexandria two times? Why no, crowning I didn't your, I'm sorry, I didn't mean why that crowning was, yourself Pharaoh? No, no, you know, no, I, I don't mean that it wasn't his original goal, but it wasn't a failure. What he wound up with, you know, it wasn't a failure. He had rendered this potential enemy who they this was the sixth Syrian war. Oh, he rendered them so weak. Right. And they're fighting, you know, between the Ptolemy brothers and yeah. things like that. I don't mean it wasn't his goal. Of course, it was his goal. Of course, he wanted to be Alexander. Of course, you're right. Right. Well, all, all I, I, mean I, I do. Is, I do agree. I yeah. do agree with you. He, 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 he secured his kingdom. Uh, he, he weakened his enemies. So therefore, that was that was a, a success. Uh, and we're not talking about the spoils that he brought back to Egypt. So, yes, in the long run, that was a success when considering that he, he, he secured the borders of his kingdom for, for a decade. Now, I, I was just quibbling uh, with the word failing. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. But I, I think we're, we're, we're on the same page. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think that he must have resented the fact that he could, not, he could not realize the dream of his forefathers or Antiochus the Great and simply annex. The, uh, the Egyptian kingdom, you know, uh, but yes, it was a mixed, a mixed, uh, a mixed feeling for sure. Yeah, yeah I, I would say that uh, the failure was not to not be able to conquer Egypt because well, at first it was a defensive war, or at least it was presented like this, but it was the way it happened because, well, the whole army, the whole army and the king that had to withdraw before a figure. Yeah. He was, he was not beaten. He was uh, he was intimidated by by an ambassador. He he had the high ground. He, he could have stand his ground and uh, and completed the conquest, but he, he chose not to do so. You know, and um, you were you were right to point out his biography about being a hostage. Because I have the feeling in that scene on the sands there that he knew this guy, this you know Papilius, you know, and because I think he was going, you know, you know, you know. It's so great to see you. And then the guy gives him this incredible scene with the circle in the sand and everything like that. Yeah. But I think psychologically, I'm thinking, you know, Stockholm syndrome, you know, he'd been a hostage there. He was a kind of, is it Roma, Rom, Romanophile? What would the right word be? Um, and uh, so the biographical thing also was like used where the psychology, there was incredible psychological intimidation. Yes, and, and because he, he evolved within aristocratic circles in Rome, right. he probably understood um, to what extent these guys were willing to go to enforce their, their policy, you know. Uh, there was still an army, there were still Roman legions in the East at the time. They, they were not that far away, they were in Greece. So he was not willing to call the bluff. Because he knew them personally, because he evolved within aristocratic circles in Rome, um, so he must have been resentful. But he he knew what he was dealing with, and certainly Perseus uh, understood it the the hard way. At the same time, at the very very same moment. All time, sure you have questions. Uh, yes, I, I do. But first of all, thank you uh, to to both um, Pierre Luc and Gemma for um, your very interesting thoughts. Now, um, my heart is more devoted to the constructivist side than to the realist side. However, mm -hmm. what I do see is that every good constructivist analysis does include realist perspectives um, and elements. And I do see at the same time, um, all really good neorealist uh, analyses 
also um, reject some of the most radical um, problems. Um, and yeah, you repeated uh, the denial of billboard uh, balls, uh, which is, I think, mm -hmm. very important. And I think you've done much more. So let us see how things are converging. So the, the uh, unipolar uh, moment very clearly is a thought that can only be developed on a realist background, um, mm -hmm. seeing that there are uh, formal structures that then shape and show behavior. So a very good, uh, a very good starting point and also very well um, uh, illustrated by the two examples you have chosen. So very convincing. But I'm very happy to see that, uh, on the other hand, uh, you very strongly also drew on constructivist uh, thoughts, namely uh, when you said that uh, um, the nature of kingship, of Hellenistic kingship, matters so much. And in the case of Antiochus, his whole strategy of, well, of exerting, demonstrating, developing his kingly prestige uh, on the one hand throughout the Greek world amongst his subjects and beyond, while on the other hand, trying to show to the Romans his loyalty as, as a friend and ally, that is genuinely constructivist, I would say. Right. Um, and, um, and that is not a weakness of your approach or theory, but rather I consider it a strength and uh, a very good way forward um, because that then yields much uh, more convincing explanations. I'm still trying to deepen my understanding of what unipolarity means if we compare it with the notions of hegemony versus empire, imperial structures. Yeah. I think you were much, uh, if I can articulate the question a little bit more. Yes. Uh, you were much clearer by expl explaining what you th uh, feel is the imperial moment. Um, and uh, hegemony would have started even in a multipolar environment. So predates Apamea for sure. And we can put it perhaps at the very beginning of the second Macedonian war. Um, and uh, if not at the, at the second Illyrian war, um, uh, but um, the transition uh, is uh, is not very clear to me. And I, I think all these terms are very fluid because yeah. I, I adhere to the, to the Strabonian notion of empire. The Strabonian notion of empire as defined in the very last chapter of Strabo's geography includes all kinds of vessels and allies into the empire. So officially autonomous, um, autonomous entities uh, that are still bound in one way or another uh, to a leader, whether it's a unipolar or multipolar leader. And so basically I, I might see that everything after Magnesia is just transitional. Uh, so uh, how, however you try to define a sharp spot, you do find these elements, well, starting with Apamea, but then also Pydna um, and so, I'm still a little bit swimming here and yes. trying to find some firmer ground. And this is why I devoted so much pages in the monograph to clearly define what the concept are. When we're talking about international unipolarity, we are only describing what was the distribution of power within a system at a given time? That's it, that's all. Uh, when we're talking about international bipolarity, we are only stating the fact that military might or military, military power in a system, such as the international system after the Second World War, military power were, was concentrated in the hands of two great powers. That's it, that's all. We're not by by stating that a system was unipolar at a moment uh, at a given moment we are not trying to describe what was the policy of any given actor at the moment a unipolar power such as the us or rome at the time could could decide to disengage from the international seed could could decide to 
isolate itself from the international scene or co could, to the contrary, decide to military intervene, that does not change anything to the fact that it still remains a unipolar power. So these are two different things. The distribution of power is one thing, unipolarity, bipolarity, and multipolarity, and what a state decides to do with that power is another thing. The policy policy is another thing. Um, and hegemony is the will to influence other international actors. Um, and it's different from empire building, you know? Um, and the Romans, uh, during that transition period of international unipolarity, the Romans followed a path that went from isolation, it's, it's difficult to say in English for a Francophone, isolationism. Uh, they went from isolation to intervention in 146 uh, or in 162, uh, 172 with the Third Macedonian War. But in my view, these interventions or this shift from isolation to intervention was prompted by security concerns, uh, by destroying Corinth, by destroying Carthage, by dismantling uh, the Macedonian monarchy. They simply put a final word, uh, a final solution to a problem which, with which they were dealing for decades. Uh, but it took time, you know. Uh, the Romans intervened in the Greek world uh, in the, the years 190-180 and then retreated, went back, went back to Italy without annexing or conquering any territories. So it took, it took mainly three decades to see that shift occurring. But unipolarity only describes the distribution of power, nothing else. Um, the policy that unipolar power decide to pursue is something, something else. Today, the United States could, could isolate itself uh, and nevertheless be the most powerful country in, in the world. That does not change anything to the distribution of power. That changed something though uh, with the security concerns of, of international players. If a unipolar power is invested uh, on the international scene, in the, on the international stage, well, that's a that's another ball game, you know. That could, could prompt security concerns for minor power. Whereas, whereas if Rome decided to isolate itself in Italy, it prompted other uh, other concerns. So, I, I tried, and I hope ha I hope I've been successful to to distinguish these these notions uh, in the introduction of my book. Thank you very much, it, and it helped uh, really to summarize it uh, so clearly again at uh, what I would say is the end of our joint public event, because we have reached our end time, uh, which does not mean that we can continue with the chat, but I would like to formally thank you, Pierre-Luc, uh, once again for your really stimulating presentation. And I think uh, you, uh, your thoughts and your arguments will also uh, continue to inform the debate in, in the next years. Um, so. Um, uh, congratulations uh, to this. And uh, Jamin, also thank you very much for supporting our discussion today and helping our joint learning efforts. Uh, when uh, closing our lecture today, I would also like uh, to, to thank my co-host, uh, Dr. Rabbi Ben Skolnik, uh, once again. And uh, I would further like to announce our upcoming lecture in March, again, March 15th, by uh, Oliver Hoover from the American Numismatic Society. Um, and the title is quite catchy, Ghost Stories, Uses and Survivals of the Seleucid Royal Identity on Non-Seleucid Coins. So I hope many of you are going to join us again in a month. Um, I say, Farewell and uh, hope to see you soon again.